Hebrews chapter 7, we're just going to read verse 3 this morning. And so if you're able and willing, if you want, please stand for the reading of God's holy, inspired, infallible, and inerrant word. Even one single verse. Hebrews 7, 3 says, He, that is Melchizedek, is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You can be seated and let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Your letter, as Van Til says, a letter from the triune God of the universe through Jesus Christ by the Spirit. Lord, come now by your Spirit and enlighten the eyes of our hearts. Open our ears and may the word of the Lord sink down deep into our souls, convicting us where we need convicted, comforting us where we need comforted, and leading us in the path of the obedience of faith unto glory. Pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, today in our series in the book of Hebrews, uh, we're, we're picking up in chapter 7, really for the, the fifth time in what's become a mini-series in regard to the orders of Melchizedek and the Levitical order of, of priests. We've been comparing these two different orders of priest, priestly um, groups, the order of Melchizedek and the Levitical order. The old order, the Levitical order, which was instituted after the Exodus under Moses and Aaron, centering around the tribe of Levi, where we get the name Levitical, the Levitical order. And we're comparing that, though, to the order of Melchizedek, which, as we have seen, precedes the Levitical order by hundreds of years. Because Melchizedek was a priest king who shows up in Genesis 14 as a contemporary of Abraham. And that was well before the Exodus. And the main idea here in chapter 7 is that the order of Melchizedek is superior to the Levitical order. We've seen that now for, well, this will be our fifth week. And I've tried to show us why this matters. And essentially it matters because Jesus Christ has now come as priest king in the order of Melchizedek. And he has done all that is necessary for salvation by way of his active and passive obedience. And therefore the old, the Levitical order is obsolete. The old typological Levitical order has served its purpose and now it is passing away as they cling to Christ, the ascended Christ who is now sitting at the right hand of God in the highest heavens, interceding for his people forever as eternal incarnate high priest. And therefore, this is a gospel issue for the writer of Hebrews. This is a gospel issue, and it is a sufficiency of Christ issue. And all who go backwards or will not move forwards, maturing in regard to trusting in Jesus, who is the fulfillment of all that came before, if you don't move forward and mature, you perish. So even though this section might be new or obscure to us, because how many times have you heard about the order of Melchizedek, not very often, maybe never, unless you've been working through Hebrews somewhere with someone. Well, the bottom line is that it's very important, and it is central to the writer's argument regarding Christ as superior to all that has come before. Now, today, as we keep going in this, I want to focus on chapter 7, verse 3, and I want us to see how, again, Melchizedek functions as a type, a paradigm, in regard to the Messianic priest king who was coming in the flesh, namely Jesus Christ who has come. And yet I want us to see this morning that the writer actually does something different. He does something fascinating with his typology. 
he actually shows us that Melchizedek didn't just come as a type pointing forward, forward as uh, pointing forward to the anti-type, the messianic man Jesus Christ of, of Nazareth, but he also came as an anti-type in a sense, pointing backwards to a person whom he was created to resemble. Or as Voss says, he was created in the likeness of one who already exists. And this will make more sense in the sermon, I hope, as we progress. So if you have your Bibles, look at chapter 7, verse 3. And notice that we are told that Melchizedek is without father, without mother, and he is without genealogy. And further, we're told that he is without beginning of days and he is without end of life. That's what the text says. And what we need to understand is that this is only true in the typological sense, okay? Meaning it's fairly well agreed that Melchizedek is a man. He's real flesh and blood. He's a real flesh and blood man. Uh, and he's a contemporary of Abraham. He's not a pre-incarnate Christ. He's not an angel of the Lord. He's not anything like that. He's a real man. A true man fallen in Adam, but redeemed and functioning as a priest king. And yet, he shows up in Genesis 14 with no mention of his genealogy. In a sense, he's mysterious. There is no word in Genesis 14 or even Psalm 110 where he shows up later. No word regarding his father or his mother. No word regarding his birth. All of that is unknown and unrecorded, which is Calvin's preferred translation. Unknown father or unknown mother, unknown genealogy. And then after showing up essentially out of nowhere, he disappears only to be mentioned one more time in the Old Testament. That's Psalm 110 with no mention of his death at all. And therefore, Melchizedek is a mysterious man whose earthly connections are never mentioned. He's a man who is stripped of all earthly attachments. That's what Voss says. And he seems to inhabit eternity. No beginning, no end, no genealogy. He just is and was and will be. And that is the point as far as the type goes. Keeping in mind that he really did have a father and a mother and a beginning of life and an end. And he did have a genealogy. But the fact that all of those things are missing or that they're unknown or they're not recorded, it puts him in a perfect place to function as a type, as one who points to another who truly is eternal being without father and without mother and without genealogy, without beginning and without end, and that is his purpose. You see that? Well, in support of what I've just said, Calvin himself says this, it is certain that he was begotten by parents. But the apostle is not discussing here him, discussing him here as an individual man, but rather setting him forth as the type of Christ. That's why the, 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 the lack of mention of his father and mother and genealogy is important. It's not that he didn't have those things. It says that they're not recorded. They're unknown, which puts him in a perfect place to function as the type of one who is eternal, truly. That's exactly what he's doing here. The reason he's doing it is that Melchizedek is resembling another who truly did dwell in the midst of eternity. He truly is pointing to one who is eternal. And thus, the typologically eternal man Melchizedek resembled, and get this, the already existing and eternal son of God who truly does inhabit eternity. Isaiah 57, 15. That's what the end of verse 3 says. And right here is where the author switches things on us and we cannot miss it. His typology, in a sense, switches. 
Because over and over, we've seen how types point forward, right? One reality in the Old Testament pointing forward to a greater ultimate reality, which shows up in the New. But right here, he reverses all of that, and he says that Melchizedek came on the scene, not only pointing forwards, but backwards. Or better, I think, heavenward to an already existing person, not the man Jesus Christ, but the second person of the triune God had the Son of God, who would in the fullness of time take to himself a human nature. And therefore the emphasis here is not on the humanity of the Messiah, which has been put forth over and over since chapter 1, chapters 1 through 6. But the emphasis here in verse 3 is on the deity of the Messiah, what we call his ontological sonship in regards to his deity as the Son of God. And in that sense, Melchizedek as a type, with no mention of his father or his mother or his genealogy or his beginning or his end, he functions as a type, a man who is pointing to the Son of God who truly never did have a beginning and will never have an ending because he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is from everlasting to everlasting, the one who is the radiance of the glory of his Father. And this is why the writer invokes the, the title Son of God. It is to equate him with God. So if you're, if you're confused up to this point, understand that the writer of Hebrews is making a change here. He is no longer saying that Melchizedek is a type pointing forward exclusively. But he is saying that Melchizedek is a type pointing to an already existing person. And thus... Melchizedek comes on the scene resembling the Son of God. And that little word or phrase, resembling, or made um, in the likeness unto, implies an already existing person who Melchizedek resembles. Right? If someone comes to me and they say, Your son resembles you or they say this son resembles his father what does that imply it implies that the father already exists and that the son has come forth resembling or looking like the father well the point here is that Melchizedek is resembling an already existing person not one to come only but one who is already in existence and this same kind of reality, this, this focus on the eternal nature of the Son of God, the pre-incarnate Son of God, this is nowhere else uh, put forth more explicitly than, than the Gospel of John. And so there's a great connection here between Hebrews and the Gospel of John. Here, here's what I mean. Look at John 1, starting in verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and yet without him, nothing that was made would have been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man or men. So what does that mean? That we have a Word, the Logos, and he is with God, and yet he is distinct from God. Well, who is the Word? The Word is the Son of God. He is God, but he is distinct from God as another person. Eternally existing with God, with the Father, and all things were made through the Word that is the Son. And yet, John 1, 14 and 15 says this, the Word that is, the eternal Son of God, who is God, yet distinct from the Father, he became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John says, John, 
that is the uh, John the Baptist. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. And so what do we have here? We have the Word who is God, yet he is distinct from God as his own person, the Son of God, and he becomes flesh. That is the Son of God, the second person of the triune Godhead, same in substance, equal in power and glory to the Father and the Spirit, and he takes on flesh, the Son incarnate. And then Jesus himself says this in John 8. He says this to the Jews. He says, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Ego me. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. So why did they pick up stones? Because according to the Jews, he was blaspheming by calling himself equal to God. Calling himself God. His claim to be ego me, I am, Jehovah or, or Yahweh, it is the claim to be God, in all that God is, equal with God, same in substance with God. And in fact, he was, and is, and always will be. He is the second person of the triune Godhead, subsisting as his own person. And that is why over and over again in, in the Gospel of John, Jesus claims to have been with the Father in heaven for eternity, and thus he has come forth from the Father and from heaven. He has eternally existed with the Father and the Spirit as the one true God in the highest heavens. And therefore the Son of God has no beginning. He has no genealogy. He is as Yahweh. And this helps us understand why Jesus prays the way he does on the eve of his death. Like John 17, the true Lord's Prayer, where the Lord himself is praying. John 17, 4 and 5, he says, I glorified you on earth. He's speaking to his Father. Having accomplished the work that you gave me to do, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Meaning what? That the person of the Son of God existed with the Father before the foundation of the world in glory. And he goes on to say in 17, 24, and 25, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So, what's going on here is that you have the eternal Son of God, the person of the Son of God, who has taken on a human nature, human flesh, not a human person. You cannot say that. If you say that, we're in the realm of heresy. Why? Because that would give us two persons. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is how many persons? One person. Two natures. Not two persons. That's a heresy in church history. He is one person as the Son of God. And he has taken on human flesh. And now he is praying that his human nature would enter into glory with his divine nature, the very glory he had before he took on human flesh. That he might move in his now incarnate person from humiliation to exaltation to glory, a glory that he already had before with the Father as the eternally existent Son of God. He is not praying as the Son of God that he would receive glory because that would therefore imply that he is mutable and that he can lose and receive glory. 
No, he's talking about the human nature that has been hypostatically united to the divine nature. And he is praying that he, as the now incarnate Son of God forever, might be exalted in the fullness of all that he is now as the God-man. Now, I'm going to skip all the Hebrews texts I could cite to prove that he is eternal as the Son of God, who took to himself a human nature with no change in the divine nature. But the point is, Here is that the eternality of the Son of God, in whose image or in whose likeness Melchizedek came, that is what is in view in 7.3. And that is why it matters that Melchizedek comes forth with no mention of his father, mother, genealogy, beginning or end, because he is pointing to the Son of God who truly does not have those things. And this teaches us something very, very important about our salvation and the priesthood of Christ. Something that happens and begins well before his incarnation. And how is that? Well, here's the answer. Is that the Son of God, before his incarnation, was already functioning as mediator with the offices of prophet, priest, and king, all on the basis that he would come in the flesh. Meaning that from eternity past, the eternal Son of God was already set apart for this priestly work, which is in view in Hebrews. In such a way that when sin entered in Genesis chapter 3, there was already present a priest in heaven, the Son of God, who was to come into the world incarnate. The Word already existed, who would become flesh, the Son who would take on a human nature being born in Bethlehem, meaning that the moment that sin entered in Genesis 3, And from the moment of the first gospel promise in Genesis 3, 15, there was already a high priest in heaven, pre-incarnate, who was interceding for his people on the basis of what he would come and do. And that is something we have not talked about yet in this series. Now, confirming this, I'm going to cite two of my favorite theologians. First, Bavink. In wonderful works of God, he says this, Insofar as Christ was prepared from eternity to come into the world, to fulfill God's will, he was already a priest from eternity. And then, my absolute favorite, Voss, in volume three of his Reformed Dogmatic, says this, and this is longer, but it is amazing. He asked the question, How do the offices of Christ stand in relation to each other with regard to order in time and in relation to the states of the mediator? Meaning, before he's flesh, is he prophet, priest, and king? Or only after he's flesh? And is he prophet, priest, and king on earth in his humiliation or in his exaltation? That's what he's asking. This is his answer. For God in his eternity... The completion of the mediatorial work is eternally given, and by the suretyship of the Son, it is established from eternity. What's that mean? Voss is saying that the moment that it was decreed by God, it was counted as good, as finished. And therefore, Voss says, every thought, as if the mediator occupied his offices, thus priest, Only after his incarnation must therefore be rejected. Rather, we should say that he has occupied his three offices during two dispensations. During the shadowy and the embodied dispensations of the covenant of grace. The old and the new. That's what he means there. Believers who were saved during the old day could not have been saved otherwise than by the official activity of the Messiah. 
Earlier, it was already pointed out that the prophets, priests, and kings in Israel were not only shadows or types, but also messengers and representatives of the great antitype, or maybe archetype, who's in heaven presently, and was presently during the old, working through these offices. He says, they, the prophets, priests, and kings of the old, derive their official authority from the person himself, whom they as office bearers proclaimed in a shadowy fashion. Certainly it is true that at that time Christ did not yet have a human nature, but his person, that is his personality as the second person of the triune Godhead, his person was still the person of the one anointed from eternity. According to God's counsel of peace and his own voluntary suretyship, he was the Logos to become flesh. Do you see what Voss has just done there? He has just solved every problem we have regarding the salvation of those under the old covenant, and he has crucified once and for all any and all kinds of dispensational theology. He says all kinds of important things there, but notice that he roots the old covenant work of the pre-incarnate mediator which is by the Spirit, who is at work in the prophets, priests, and kings on earth, he roots it in the fact that there was an eternal plan and decree of God to save. He calls it here the Pactum Salutis, or the Council of Peace, or sometimes we call this the eternal covenant of redemption. And this covenant of redemption, or the covenant of peace or the pactum salutis, it becomes the very foundation for the application and the work of the mediator in the old covenant before he actually takes on human flesh. Now, what exactly is the covenant of redemption? Well, in simplest terms, it is the eternal bedrock for the historical outworking of salvation and the covenant of grace. Or Burkhoff in his systematic theology defines it this way. It is the agreement between the Father, giving the Son as head and redeemer of the elect, and the Son. It's an agreement between the Father and the Son who voluntarily takes the place of those whom the Father has given him. That's the covenant of redemption. Therefore, it is an inner Trinitarian arrangement in eternity past, where because of sin a people are chosen and a surety or mediator is appointed for their salvation. A mediator who being prophet, priest, and king by appointment in eternity past would accomplish all that must be accomplished for the salvation of his chosen people. And how would he do that? He would do that by taking on human flesh. And because of this eternal covenant of redemption or plan or pactum salutis or this inner Trinitarian agreement and plan of, of the triune God between the three persons, because that has been decreed, then the Spirit can apply the work of Christ before he comes as well as after he comes because he was already at work as mediator before he comes in the flesh. And all that this means that God did not just decree that creation exists, and he didn't only decree that the fall happen, and he did, but the Father, Son, and Spirit covenant to save a people through the Son and by the Spirit. All in eternity past in the covenant of redemption. A reality which we watch happen and unfold in the scriptures in real space and in real time from Genesis 3.15 on where the covenant of grace begins. And it moves through a period of types and shadows under the old pointing to the already existing son of God who is set apart and appointed as mediator, as prophet, priest, and king in the covenant of redemption all the way through to the set-apart Son coming in the flesh to do the work, the work that the Father gave him. Which then is followed by the Spirit 
poured out after his ascension, visibly poured out at Pentecost to apply to the elect, the finished work of the Messianic Son, the God-Man. So if you want to understand the covenant of redemption, essentially take everything that you see unfold in the scriptures regarding Christ and his work and everything that prepares us for the work of Christ in regard to redemption and salvation, condense all of it into a single eternal decree in eternity past, and you have the covenant of redemption. It is the eternal plan of God regarding the Son as surety and Savior of a particular people who are dead in sin. In one sense, you could say that the covenant of redemption is the Son's covenant of works with the Father as the last Adam. He has been given a covenant of works whereby he must come and do all the work that is necessary, perfect and exact obedience. He must bear the wrath and curse And the covenant of grace is the covenant that exists between the Son and his his saved seed. Now, the point of all of this is that Melchizedek existed as a typologically eternal priest king to point to an already existing prophet, priest, and king who was already present in heaven as mediator, appointed by God in eternity past for a future work in the flesh. The Son of God who was set apart or appointed in the eternal covenant of redemption for the salvation of an elect people. And because he was set apart by the eternal and immutable decree of God, the God who has sworn and does not change his mind forever, Psalm 124, because that was true and is true, he was already functioning in these offices before his incarnation, already functioning as the priest king to whom Melchizedek as a type was already pointing. But always on the basis that he was the word to become flesh. The son of God who would take on a human nature in the fullness of time to do the work of the father. And this being true implies what? It implies that there has never ever been any other high priest through whom any person has ever been saved except through the Son. He is the only true high priest. Not even the Levites or Aaron. They too existed to point heavenward and forward to the true priest eternal in the heavens, the Son of God. And therefore there has never been another name under heaven given among men by which We must be saved. There's never been any other way or truth or life. The high priest for Abraham and David was the pre-incarnate eternal son of God who was to become incarnate. This is why later Voss in Dogmatics 3 can say that Christ is the only true, eternal, kingly, self-sacrificing, atoning toward God, substituting and actually guilt-removing high priest. He is the only one. Therefore, everything and everyone on earth has existed to point to him and his pre-incarnate state as mediator who was to become flesh. And finally, in the fullness of time, his incarnate state, now in exalted glory as the God-man at the right hand of God in heaven. And in this sense, Melchizedek came pointing in two directions at the same time. You see that? He comes pointing heavenward and forward all at the same time as a type. Heavenward toward the Son who was set apart from eternity for his mission and forward to the same Son incarnate who would come executing the mission with absolute precision all in such a way that Jesus himself can say in John 17, 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Followed two chapters later by his final words on the cross, it is finished. What is finished? The work that the Father gave the Son to do in the eternal covenant of redemption. 
That is the work that the Father gave the Son to do for our salvation in the covenant of grace whereby we are saved without works only by grace through faith. Why without works? Because the work has been accomplished by another. Now, if you want to read up on this, just read Westminster Confession 7 and 8. Especially 8.1, where it says that the Father set apart the Son of God in eternity. Now, as we begin to close, see and understand that the Son set apart in the covenant of redemption from eternity past. He has held these offices, prophet, priest, and king, before his incarnation and after. And in his humiliation and his exaltation. And if you understand this, you understand a very important unifying reality that unifies salvation from Genesis to now all within the framework of a single covenant of grace. Meaning that from the moment that the Son is set apart, and from the moment that he begins acting as mediator, as prophet, priest, and king because of sin, Genesis 3.15, from that moment on, there is a unified way of salvation through one single person. The Son of God, eternal in the heavens, who was to become flesh, who would live, die, be buried, be raised, and ascend back to heaven in glory. And if all of this is true, then it is obvious that the order of Melchizedek is superior <laughs> to the Levitical order. You can't say any of this about the Levitical order. These were human beings who were sinful, fallen in Adam, who were taken for a time to serve as priests, and then they died. And regarding the Levitical priesthood, the genealogy was everything. In fact, when they come back from exile, if their name wasn't in the genealogy, or if the genealogy couldn't be found, you know what? No priesthood. I don't care what you say about who your parents were. It's not in writing. And yet the Son of God, eternal in the heavens, is without genealogy. And this is another reason for why the author of Hebrews wants them to get rid of their attachment to the old covenant and to move into the new. And in a real sense, he wants them to see that the true heavenly reality has always existed. And that same heavenly reality, which was foreshadowed and typified in the old covenant, which is pointing us heavenward and forward, that true heavenly reality has now come down in the flesh. The true reality which has been there all along, administered through types and shadows in the old, it has now come down in the incarnate Son of God, manifest once and for all in human history. This is where we get the Vossian triangle. But Voss says in his little book on the letter of, uh, to the Hebrews, is that you have a, an axiom here, a point, and this is a type. And this type is pointing to a, a future anti-type reality. But at the same time, this historical old covenant reality is pointing to a heavenly reality. So you have a triangle. This point, this point, and this point. And what Voss says is that this reality, the heavenly reality to which these earthly types and shadows pointed, the anti-type in the future is this heavenly reality come down. And if you see that and you understand that, then it doesn't matter where you are. In Genesis chapter 12, in the book of Deuteronomy, in the book of Isaiah, or in the book of Hebrews, salvation has been through one single heavenly person, the Son of God. 
And in this way, the writer of Hebrews is essentially arguing that if they do not receive Christ as the eternal Son of God, who has always been prophet, priest, and king for his people since Genesis 3.15 and in eternity past, if they reject him, the true heavenly reality which is now manifest in the flesh, the Messiah who is the God-man, then they have actually never truly known God at all. Why? Because if you don't know the Son, you do not know the Father. And if you reject the Son, you reject the Father. This is why it is so obscene that early dispensationalists would actually say that the Jews were saved by the Mosaic covenant of works. What are they doing there? They're saying that there are two different ways of salvation for two different groups of people. Whereas the writer of Hebrews is saying no. There's only ever been one way of salvation, and that is through the eternal Son of God who was set apart, set apart and appointed for this in eternity past, who has now come in the flesh and done the work that the Father gave him to do. And if this is true for the Hebrews, that if they reject the Son, they do not have the Father, then it is equally true for us this morning. Which means that when it comes to the Christian faith, we have to understand that it is the only true religion in the world. There is no neutrality. The Jews, even the Jews who now exist, they belong to the devil who is their father, unless they have turned to Jesus Christ. To not know and trust in the Son is to reject the Father, and it is to not know the one true God at all. Therefore, Christianity lays exclusive claim on knowing God, the only true God. And therefore, anyone who is not a Christian, any Hebrew who has not received the Son, any person in any other place in the world who is worshipping in another religion, they are worshipping not the one true God, but an idol. And that means that there is absolutely no neutrality. You have the Son and therefore have the Father, or you have neither. There is no such thing as knowing or believing in the one true God apart from the Son. And that has always been true because the Son is eternal mediator. Do you see why the Trinitarian understanding of the one true God is foundational to Christianity? This is why oneness Pentecostalism is a heresy. And Newcastle's filled with oneness Pentecostals. They're not Christians. They worship a false god. You understand that? It doesn't matter what they say because they worship a non-Trinitarian God. And therefore it is a false God. And therefore their baptism is not Christian baptism. It is baptism into an idolatrous cult. Because according to them, when did the Son come into existence? When he came into existence in the flesh. What's the writer of Hebrews say? That he is the eternal son of God. Set apart as the second person of the triune God had for a mission which will happen later. And he is distinct from the father and the son. Meaning if you lose the triune nature of God. Do you know what you lose? Everything we stand for. So no I don't go easy on one as Pentecostals. We call them heretics. And we tell them to repent of their heresy, to turn to Jesus Christ, who is the second person of the triune Godhead, and to be rebaptized, because they're baptized into a cult. You either have the Son and the Father, or you have neither, and you perish. There is no tertium quid. And therefore, we must. Run to the Son. We must cling to the Son, the eternal Son. 
We must confess our sins and cling to him, the one who is set apart for, from all eternity for this very reality, our salvation. It is only through the Son and nowhere else where we can be accounted as perfectly righteous, where our sins can be forgiven, and through whom we can be reconciled to the Father, through the Son and by the Spirit. He is the prophet, priest, and king, the federal head of a new humanity, those who were chosen and are united to him by a spirit of faith. And I want you to see and understand this morning that this was the plan and person purpose of the triune God from eternity past wherein in the fullness of time the eternal son of God eternally appointed for this work with a threefold office where in the fullness of time he would come once and for all to do his work and he has all in order that we might be brought back into the presence of God where the risen and exalted high priest of heaven now is, and where we too will be one day. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.